bless you. <laughs> Indeed, I'd like to say good morning. It's good to be alive, amen? amen? And I'm very encouraged by the personal efforts that you are putting forth. And you know, when we hear the word of God, we become tools in his hand to impact lives for the kingdom. We do not have to wait on a committee. I'm so glad that heaven did not pull a committee together to decide to send his son, Jesus Christ. He said, Lord, here I am. Send me. So my prayers are with you all. What do we can do? Praise God. If each one of us can take personal responsibility of touching one life, we will be in the kingdom like yesterday. I'd like to have a word of prayer as we navigate through the scripture. Father God in heaven, time has, Lord, transpired into eternity. I pray that this morning, as we've heard all the testimony and praise and songs, that you will speak a word from heaven. Take these clay lips and put your words into them. And Lord, I ask that you would download your thoughts into this mind of mine, and that you will open up our hearts that the shackles might be broken, and that we might be a people that would give a message of freedom to those who set in bondage. In Jesus' name we pray, and for his name's sake, amen. We will use the screen this morning. For the sake of time, I'd like for you to do a few things. You need to be praying as God speaks to our hearts. Pray that God will give us understanding, and with that understanding, that we might make the right application to his word. We do not just want to be entertained with his word. We want to be impacted by his word that we will indeed be new creatures that we can def definitely touch lives for the kingdom. And so we're going to go into the greatest medical book that ever been written. Do you have your medical books with you this morning? Can I see them? Let's hold them up. Last night we found out that these are the medical book. I shared with the folk my little story of a 10-year battle with arthritis that stopped my career as a professional basketball player. And I realized that, was anybody here with me last night? All right, three things my doctor told me. All right, this is on your test. Remember that? What was the three things my doctor told me? No, no, no cause. That's right. And no, no cure, and take drugs for the rest of your life. That's been over about 40-some mm, years ago. I remember when I was inducted into the Hall of Fame, I went back to that school hoping to see the doctor to let him know that God is greater than man. Amen. A ten-year battle, I stand here free. I used to tell the folks, I used to predict the weather. I lost that job. <laughs> Though I do not have a basketball, but God gave me a Bible. Though I do not go up and down the basketball court, I now travel up and down the earth court. And retirement is out of this world. Fly, flying the friendly skies without no money because God owned those skies. So let's navigate through the scripture. I'm going to put few up on the board for the sake of time. In the book of John chapter 10, if you look at that and let's put your mind or your face in the book. What does the Bible say in John 10, 10? Read that with me. What does it say? The thief what? And what? And? And? But to do what? And life. If time will permit, I will ask everyone in here your definition of abundant life. And since we don't have time, but let me just echo what I believe you would say. Abundant life is that having physical, mental, and spiritual health. Abundant life will be debt free. Abundant life, have a good job, wonderful family peace, joy, etc., 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 abundant life, happy home. And I believe all those things God is very mindful of, all of those things he's mindful of, job, family, health, financial stability, which as the dear sister gentleman said, pretty soon will come a time that we might not have those things, which we define as abundant life. Can you still have abundant life when you don't have a job? Can you still have abundant life when your spouse forsaken you? Hmm. Can you still have abundant life when there's a mortgage due and you don't have enough money? These, what we must understand, 
is the very foundation of our, our definition of abundant life, that it is not predicated upon materialism, though God understand that. But to have a peace in the midst of a storm when nothing can disturb that peace is abundant life, which is the precursor for that life to come. But we can have that life here on this earth. Are you with me? And as we always say in the health presentation, 3 John 2, the Bible said, Beloved, I wish what? You can quote that by heart. But of all things, I wish that you prosper and do what? Be in health even as I what? Now, I want you to notice that last phrase. It says, be in health even as thy what? Soul prospereth. That means in proportionate to our spiritual growth, we will become more faithful stewards of our physical existence. It is impossible, it is a contradiction for me to be a Christian and neglect the house that God built for me to dwell in. What do you think about that? It's proportionate to my spiritual growth. So let's go back to the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, I highlighted some concepts in yellow. You'll notice on the screen here, I have dust of the ground, I have the breath of life, and I have living soul. I want to correspond that to three aspects of the human body or the human existence. The dust is the physical. We find here the spirit of life is the spiritual. The living soul is the mental. What am I saying? In essence, as we look at this, you and I are three-dimensional. That means we are made up of three qualities. Look at the first one. What's the first one down there? Is the what? Physical. What's the second? What's the third one? It's, it is spiritual. Therefore, we are three-dimensional beings. Very important to understand, we are, deep, we are not departmentalized. That means our body is not in one place, our mind somewhere else, and our soul in another place. There are three professional people, and there's no indictment on these three professional people that address one of these qualities. When you and I have been diagnosed with a physical existence, what professional people do, person do we consult with? The physician. Talk to me, right? When we have a mental problems, what professional person do we seek out? And when we have a spiritual problem, what professional person do we seek out? The pastor. So we have the physician, the psychologist, and the what? Now, in my 66 years, I have not met three individuals like that that agree with one another. When I am sick in the body, the doctor said, well, it's in your body. And when I'm sick, the doctors of psychology would say, it's in your mind. When the preacher talked to me, he said, no, it's in your soul. And those three professional persons do not agree with one another. Therefore, not an indictment, but if I departmentalize my existence and trust my mind in one place, my body somewhere else, then I cannot be whole. Am I making sense? When we go to the scriptures, we're going to see something. That when I deal with people or address people from a physical level, just in case in point, when a person has been diagnosed with cancer, the focus is on the cancer rather than the person. Because it's a person that has the cancer. Am I making sense? Because even cancer has an attitude. We're going to see that. No matter whether you take physical, whether you take chemotherapy, whether you take herbal therapy, but if you do not address the total person, there can never be sustainable health. Am I making sense to one person in here? So when Jesus said in the book of Matthew, Chapter 9, verse 12, and John 5, 6. He used the word whole. We saw that last night. Jesus said, I did not come for the righteous, but for the unrighteous. I didn't come for those who are righteous, but they that need healing. He said, wholeness. Notice what he says. They that be whole need not a what? But they that are sick. I remember in John chapter 5, 6. On one Sabbath day, there was a man there at the pool of Bethesda waiting for the movement of the water. Therefore, every time he inched up, tried to get in, someone stronger than him got into the pool. Most people believe that the movement of the water there at Bethesda was something of supernatural by God, but it was not of God. It was not of God. God does not operate on the survival of the fittest. God's plan is accessible to everyone. Are you with me, ladies and gentlemen? 
From the very stream of Atonia, there was a stream flowing down, and it was a myth that there was an angel that stirred that water. And so just case, just, just think it with me, Nashville First Church. If you had a pool located here in your parking lot, and Nashville knew that there, there on the very parking lot of Nashville First Church, it has been told when that pool started moving and anybody stepped in with lupus and AIDS, they would be free. How many people would be here? Oh, you wouldn't have a place to house them. Everybody looking for a quick fix rather than obedience. But notice in Bethesda, when you look at that word Bethesda, you put your eyes on John chapter 5, verse 6, and you see the spelling B E T H S D A. Is anybody here drinking water with me in here? And so the word Bethesda means the house of mercy. And so the last three letters on Bethesda is S-D-A. Therefore, this church needs to be the house of mercy. Everybody needs to be beating down this door looking for mercy. Oh, you ain't with me this morning. But if we are in shackle, how can we give a message of freedom? Are you with me, ladies and gentlemen? There is no mystical medicine out here, no blowing on the faces, no waving old hands. There's power in God's word. And we find here that even in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, continue to define these three dimensions. When God said, I want you to love me with all, my, all your mind and all your soul, all your might. Once again, physical, mental, and spiritual. Even in the life of Jesus, in Luke chapter 2, verse 40, you can write it down, put your mind, eyes on it. In verse 52, the Bible says, and Jesus increased how? And, and, and so here we see in the life of Jesus those three qualities again. Are you with me? So man is three-dimensional. You cannot separate that. Keep this in mind because it will be on your test in a moment. So let's go here to Matthew chapter 9 and verse, verses 1 through 8. The Bible says, when Jesus was dealing with a man sick of the palsy, the first thing he said in verse 2, son, be a what? But in King James, said good cheer, which definitely is good courage because the opposite of cheer is fear. You find that the devil most effective tool that he used to take your joy, my joy, and peace is discouragement. Yes. We all face discouragement. That is part of life. But we don't have to be controlled by discouragement. Amen. So this man went under depression and guilt because during that time, it was stated that anybody that suffered a condition, it was the finger of God. So if God put his finger on you, then where is my hope? Discouragement. Then the man went into condemnation and guilt. Then the second thing God said to this man, thy sins be forgiven thee. Remorse. Hmm? Guilt. Keep this in mind. And then he said... Take up that bed and walk. But if you put your eyes on John chapter 5, put your eyes on that in verse 6, and you find verse 7, Jesus said, which is easier for me to do? Here's a question. Might not be rhetorical, but Jesus asking you and I, which is easy for me to do? To say thy sins be forgiven thee or take that bed and walk? My question to you, which is easy for Jesus to do? Talk to me very quick. My time is moving. Come on, talk to me. Which is easy? Now, before you answer that, please pray in your mind, who is God? Come on, talk to me now. What is easy for Jesus to do? To say, thy sins be forgiven thee? I didn't say what easy for me to do. I said what is easy for Jesus to do. <laughs> oh, there's confusion in Nashville. There's speaking in tongues in here. Let's cast out this confusion. We serve a sovereign God. Let me help you out a little bit. When Jesus healed, he said, go and sin no more. I want you to follow me. If there was never any sin, there would be no cancer. If there was no sin, there would be no high blood pressure. If there was no sin, there would be no manic depression. Are you with me, ladies and gentlemen? As a result of sin, we suffer. Therefore, those two go hand in hand. There's nothing too hard for your God and my God. Amen. Forgiveness and healing are interrelated. You're not listening to me. 
You cannot have physical healing without forgiveness. For 40 years I've been in this work and I've seen people just want to tap into the physical. Then they wonder why they're not healed. Because you can't separate those two. Are you listening to me? Keep this in mind. I'll take nothing away from this but this. There is an intimate relationship between forgiveness and healing. That's why we want to talk about the healing power of forgiveness. And you heard many sermons about that. But we're going to navigate. We might see some things we've never seen in our discussion this morning very quickly. So, Father, just be with us in Jesus' name. The Bible tells us in the book of Psalms 103, let's read it together. What does it say? Let's read it together. Know what? Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastor. So the Bible declares emphatically that God is the one who owns us. Amen? Amen. He is the one who created us. So he's given us and what? So we saw this last night. So we found out what's the purpose of an owner's manual. Hmm? Tell you how to operate the product. Amen? How to maintain the product. I remember several years ago, one of my computer malfunctioned. Now, I'm computer illiterate, totally. I know how to probably check my emails, do a little searching of the web. I know how to put PowerPoints together. But when I went over there to the IT guys <laughs> and to give them my jump drive, they said, well, you got a cell phone. We can do it on a cell phone. We can do it on a tech phone. We can do all kinds of phone. I said, praise God for you, man. You're pretty good here. <laughs> See, I was born on the other side of computer. I'm 60, almost 67. I, you know, I, there was no computer during my time. So when I need my computer, I've got a little granddaughter. I think she's about three or four. I go to her, ask her what to do. Hey, hey, what, what, how can I fix this? Are you with me, ladies and gentlemen? And unfortunately, some of us on those dumb phones, I asked last night, uh, how many phone numbers do you know? You, how many do you know? What's your wife's phone number? <laughs> I got it. I just caught you off guard. <laughs> I said this to one person at church, boy, he was so embarrassed he forgot, and he went last the night and started searching the phone, so he came back and gave me the answer. He didn't know his wife's phone number, unless he went on the fo- cell phone. It has messed us up, but I know you know your wife's phone number. Praise God. We have lost the little bit of the ability of our mind to function. You know what I'm saying? And so we find here. So I was, um, my computer malfunctioned. We live in the western part of Tennessee in the woods. We, we back in the woods somewhere. There's nobody else back there with us. And so I connected with the technician. I called the technician. I gave them as much information as possible about my computer. And he told me to push a button. I pushed a button. Then he told me to take my hands off the computer. I took my hands off the computer. Then the cursor was moving. I'm just sitting there watching. Now, I know this is nothing new to you, but it blew my mind. (laughs) Then he fixed my computer. Then uh, the next little town, the major town is 15 miles from us, and then the next larger town is Jackson, Tennessee, which is 30 miles. Then the next big town is Nashville and Memphis. So I'm just assuming. I know he's not in the woods with me. I know he's not there. There's no, I know that. He has to be in Jackson somewhere. But you know the story. I said, sir, where are you located? He told me he was in the Philippines. <laughs> All right? So here's a man across the world. Now, in where I live... T-Mobile won't work where I live unless you get by the garbage can. It won't work. I'm serious. You got to have Verizon. So, so therefore, the pre- reception, he is in where? The Philippines fixing my computer. And as I sat back and marvel, and I believe the Spirit of God spoke, he said, son, let me share something with you. I'm a sovereign God. That computer's made out of sand. See, the rock's crying out. Mm. So, listen to me. You connected with the technician. I want you to connect with me. He told you to take your hands off the apparatus. I want you to take your hands off your life and give me control and I will fix it. The hardest thing for us to do is to surrender our will to God and let him fix it. 
If God can speak to a man and, 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 and correct and fix an inanimated object, that man didn't get wisdom from anywhere. That wisdom was downloaded. <laughs> and we marvel at, technici- at technology. But we, can't, we trust technology. We put all our information on computer. My lovely wife, bless her heart. She, she, tear up, she take all, her, all the name, her name, my name, off all the, the magazine and, 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 and shred it. And, she'd be throw, and if I take the, the envelope with our name and throw it in the garbage can, she just freaks out. She said, no, get that name. I said, honey, you're already in cyberspace. <laughs> <laughs> it's no good. You're already in cyberspace. <laughs> Are you with me, ladies and gentlemen? So if God gave man ability, to, what can he do for your life? We've got to take our hands off our life. So the Bible tells me as we move quickly on, let's read this together. What does it say? Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thy iniquities, and who healeth all of thy diseases. There's an intimate relationship between healing and forgiveness. Very important to understand. The story of the leprosy. Put your eyes, please, quickly. On Luke chapter 5, put your eyes on Luke 5, verse 12 and 13. Please put your eyes. Now, put your face in the book. You know, Facebook has over 700 some million uh, visitors. And if Facebook was, was a nation, it would be the third largest nation in the world. So let's take your face out of the Facebook and put it in the book. Is that all right? Now, I want you to look at it for a moment. Luke chapter 5, verse 12 and 13, because there's a word there. Here is a leopard comes to Jesus. He did not say, Jesus, do you have the power to heal me? He said, if you will, you can cleanse me. You see it in there? You see it there? I'm talking. Do you see it? Okay. Then Jesus said, I will. Be thou what? Now look at verse 13. In the King James Version, there is a word that stands out to me. Say it again, my sister. Immediately, the leopard was cleansed. I want you to follow me. And you'll find the story of leprosy in the book, in the book of Le- uh, Leviticus chapter 13 and verse 14. We're not going to go there. But that's where you find the whole story of leprosy. So the leper was cleansed how quickly? Immediately. 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 You find of all the diseases of which mankind is heir, there's none more loathsome than leprosy. The individual lives, lives for years with this dread disease, slowly eating away even the appendage and the portions of his body until long till he longs for death and release. We find here leprosy eats away the fingers and affects every tissue and nerve of the body. It starts with the central nervous system, desensitizing the central nervous system to the point when the fingers start falling off, you feel no pain. They were doing a documentary of a leopard camp, and as this leopard was smoking a cigarette, his finger was on fire. The videography was kind of Taken back, they said, he doesn't feel any pain, so they had to stop shooting. This man did not feel any pain because his nerves was damaged already. Leprosy is a dreadful disease. From earliest time, leprosy has been a type of what? A very fitting type. It is of that loathsome spiritual disease which destroys the soul of the one who violates his conscience again and again until he has no power to resist and becomes wholly surrendered to evil. Leprosy is a type of sin. What are you saying, Jackson? When Miriam, anybody heard of Miriam, the sister of Moses, complained and murmured against Moses and his wife, she became a leopard. Murmuring and complaining is leprosy. I remember Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, after Naaman was healed in that muddy river. And he offered Elijah some money. Elijah said, no, I don't need your money. But Gehazi went after Naaman. And as he was going after him, Elijah already knew. And when he came back, Gehazi was turned to where? To what? To leprosy. Covetedness is leprosy. Jealousy is leprosy. Bitterness is leprosy. Those are fitting types of this dreadful disease. And we need to be cleansed. Romans 6, whoever you subject yourself to, you are the servant thereof. Romans 6 tell you that, verse 12 through 16. Leprosy is a very contagious disease. Notice what it says. It says here, everything the leopard touches, it contaminated. Sin also is a dreadful disease. 
the earth, the air, the water, all the cursed by the sins of humanity. It must be cleansed by the same blood which cleanses man. The leper had to put a hand over his mouth, said, unclean, unclean. Even his breath was contaminated. Sin is dreadful, ladies and gentlemen. Our very influence, just one act of sinfulness can devastate another person's life forever. Sin is not something we want to hold on to. Jesus said immediately he was cleansed. Immediately. Notice here, here's this quote. In some instances of healing, I want you to follow me. Jesus did not at once grant the blessing sought. But in the case of leprosy, no sooner was the appeal made than it was granted. When we pray for what? Earthly blessing, for a job, for a spouse, for a house, for cars. God is mindful of those things. But notice what it says. The answer to our prayer may be what? Delayed or God may give us what? Something other than we ask. But read these last, these other few words. But what? But not so when we ask for deliverance from sin. Are you listening to that? He might delay an earthly blessing, but he's mindful of our needs. But when it comes to sin, God cannot afford to delay. What is guaranteed that I will walk out of this door and do not survive? We see the devastation, the shooting down of airplanes, the loss. We see calamities everywhere. It is not safe on this earth. And we think we're getting better. It got to get worse. It got to be darkness before the dawn. But in the midst of this darkness, God is going to have a light. And the fact is, if God, as I pray for forgiveness and deliverance, and refuse to deliver me from sin, then he is chargeable for my loss. And my God didn't spend, he did not spend all of heaven in the person of the Son, Jesus Christ, that I die in my sin. Are you with me? It takes something supernatural to get rid of sin because sin is supernatural. We have a sovereign God. All we need is to want freedom. That's all we need. Notice, it is his will to cleanse us. That's Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, to make us his children. Notice what it says. Christ gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the what? To the will of our God. Is it God's will for us to be delivered from sin? Amen and amen. Notice what it says in 1 John. We read here, chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. This is the confidence. That means we have the assurity if we come to God asking anything according to his will, we can be sure he what? Hear, hear us. That's good news. People say, how do you know God hear you? When you ask according to his will, hello, he hears you because his word says that. If we confess our sin, he is what? And just to do what? Oh, that's God's word. Stand on God's word. Stand on God's word because in Colossians 1, 12 through 14, last part, it says here, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. That's God's job, to forgive and to cleanse. Amen? Is that good news? That's good news. So quickly, time is moving with these 10, 15, whatever we got here. Let's very quickly just define what is forgiveness and let's see how it affects us and close out with the fact how to experience. We're going to navigate a little deeper. But first of all, everybody like to go to the dictionary. So it says here, notice, to grant pardon, remission, somewhere along the line, I lost my aim. To grant pardon for, for or remission of an offense, to absolve, to cease to feel resentment against, follow me, to forgive one's enemy, to give up all claims on account of remit a debt. Now, further, forgiveness, why don't you follow me now? Forgiveness is dismissing a what? Yeah. Dismissing your and my demand that others what? Did you hear that? Are you with me so far? So forgiveness is dismissing a debt and also dismissing, listen what it said. Demissing my demand that the person who offended me owe me something. What do you think about that? And we're going to look deeper here. It goes on and says forgiveness is releasing your resentment. Huh? Releasing your right to hear what? Well, I'm not going to tell that person 
that are forgiven because they're not sorry. It is not predicated whether they're sorry or not. It says here, or your right to what? Get even. Forgiveness is as much about you as your offender. It removes you, it removes from you the weight of resentment, freeing you to live a life of joy and peace. Mm. Mm. Let's go a little deeper here. In the word forgiveness, there's a word give. <laughs> and when you see the word give, it's when you choose, you know, to forgive, you give someone a freedom from having to pay the penalty for offending you. Someone offending you, you give them a gift. You don't have to pay the penalty to me for hurting me. What do you think about that? Mm. I know you, I, I, hey, I know it's processing in here. It might sound good, but when you really go home, if I was a fly on your wall, it's a little different. Follow me now. But God is able. Listen to what it says. It says, because this can be a difficult gift to give, realize you're also giving yourself a gift. The gift of grudge-free living, that is true freedom. Amen. Now, I don't have time. You go write it down. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Are you following me now? Yes. So forgiveness is giving a person a gift. Send them free that they owe you something. You know you won't pay back. Come on, talk to me. It's all right, Christians. Follow me. Now, here we go. Forgiveness is a corporate work. Notice what it says. A corporate work of grace between us and what? The Holy Spirit. So forgiveness is not a human disposition or quality. Forgiveness is a divine attribute. We are not born with that spirit of forgiveness. Mm. Therefore, it has to be a choice. That God would download it <laughs> into my heart to say, I forgive you. Amen. Am I making sense? Yes, That's why we can't do it. Because we say, man, I, I'm trying to forgive this person. Hey, you're doing the impossible. You got to choose. You say, Lord, I'm hurting, but I know it is your will that I forgive. Download it through your Holy Spirit. Give me the spirit of forgiveness. Anybody with me? It goes on, it says here, the Holy Spirit removes from us the desire for vengeance. Make us person who allow the love that God has shown to us. Do what? Flow to those who hurt us. How long did God deal with you? Did he forgive you? And we have the audacity when somebody don't speak to us, abuse us, and we say, I can't forgive that. And when God said, I commended my love towards you when you hated me. So his love was not predicated upon our goodness. The object, follow me now, the object that's being loved does not determine the love of the lover. Whew, you ain't getting that either. I'm going to say that again. Uh, you got to please drink some water to get this now. The object that's being loved, I'm the object that being loved does not determine the love of the lover. God loves me anyway. His love is unconditional, but follow me, but his approval is conditional. <laughs> you ain't getting that either. His love is unconditional. You a parent? You a parent? Do you love the child? The child act crazy. <laughs> you say, I still, you know, I love you. Yes, but you're going to see some wood. <laughs> Anybody with me? But you're going to pray first and Lord, control the wood. <laughs> so it can be directly on this end here. No punching, no kicking. Are you with me? The approval is conditional. But the love is unconditional. And when the object rejects the love of the lover, the lover doesn't lose, the object lose. And when somebody say that I can't love you because you, you, you don't do right. You know, you ain't, you're not right. Listen to me. Let me help you out. Those who may be sitting here having self-pity. When nobody can, when people don't express love to you, can't love you, it is not a measure of who you are. It's a measure of the person's incapability of loving you. 
You ain't getting that. You ain't getting that. Because when we are rejected by someone, follow me, ladies and men, when we are rejected by someone, it distracts from our dignity, our identity, and our self-worth because we don't believe that we are capable of loving, being loved. But it's the person who don't know how to love you. <laughs> Did anybody get that? Because they don't know how to love because they never experienced that. Are you with me? God love is not predicated upon what you do. It's who you are because he made you. His love validates your self-worth. So my identity and self-worth is not determined by somebody else and what they do to me. It is validated because God made me. It has nothing to do with my color, my church, my economics, my education, but it deals with my origin. Ooh. It takes something like 300 million male sperms to produce life. 300 million male sperms release into that woman's canal. And the race is not to the swiftest, nor to the mightiest, but the one that endured. <laughs> Jeremiah 1.5 said, I knew you before you was formed in your mother's womb. Therefore, I'm one out of 300 million male sperm. My name, Thomas Jackson. <laughs> and that male sperm did not have a frontal lobe. God navigated that hip. <laughs> Voila! Are you with me, ladies and gentlemen? It's not my color to make war. It's God's design. He predetermined that I be here. <laughs> I'm not defying what you think about me. I'm defying what God does for me. Amen. I want you to take that with you. Are you with me, ladies and gentlemen? Let's move forward. Therefore, notice what it says here. Forgiveness changed our views of others and ourselves. We see those who hurt us as one of God's children whose sins were paid for on the cross. And who can be saved by grace. We see ourselves as what? Victors, not victims. We have a victimized mentality. I deal with, child, I deal with sexual abuse. I give seminars. And I know what it means when somebody says, well, how can God let this happen to me? But now you have a choice to realize that that experience does not define you. Keep this in mind. We find here, notice what it says. You can pick up on Matthew chapter 7, verse 2. We are not forgiven because we what? Okay, someone hurt you. I forgive you, and that's over. Uh uh. We are forgiven as we forgive. You see, the Pharisee three, says, Three strikes you out. Peter, being a hyphenated Pharisee, said seven times. <laughs> but Jesus said, No, 70 times 70. You are forgiven. As you forgive. Are you following me? You follow me. Forgiveness. Now here we are. Forgiveness is not excusing sin. Saying that what was wrong now is right. Forgiveness does not condone the act. Are you with me? It was done. It's not saying, okay, man, you, you, know, you, you, you made a mistake. It, it's all right. Mm -mm. It was not all right. When we sin against God, God said, no, it's not all right. Now, you messed up. <laughs> but let's see what happens here. Forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. Mm. You see, it takes one to forgive, two to reconcile. See, reconciliation, if there's going to be a reconciliation, because God said, I have committed to you the word of reconciliation. God in Christ reconciling us to himself. That means I cannot be reconciled to God if I'm still falling, going contrary to his will. Amos 3.3 3 said, how can two walk, walk together if they don't agree? So, therefore, we hope for reconciliation because there has to be a change in the disposition of the parties. But my forgiveness is not predicated whether you are going to reconcile with me or not. I'm going to forgive you because God wants me to forgive you. Now, if you're still going in the contrary way, I'm going to see you through the eyes of God, but we might not be able to walk together. Amen. But we know I'm not your enemy no more, and you're not my enemy. Am I making sense to anybody? So it goes on and says here, forgiveness, I like this, it's not letting the guilty off the hook, it's moving the guilty from your hook to God's hook. <laughs> I don't know if you, did you get that? Because God said vengeance is mine. So you're no longer meditating and losing sleep over this situation. Forgiveness is not being a weak martyr. It's being strong enough to be Christ-like. 
Forgiveness, notice this. Forgiveness is not based on what is fair. It was not fair to Jesus to, for Jesus to hang on the cross. Hello? Amen? Amen? It says here, but he did so that we could be forgiven. Turn with me to Jeremiah 31, 34 as we move quickly here. Please turn with me to Jeremiah. Some people say, well, Jackson, you know, we truly need to understand forgiveness because we forgive and we don't forget. Hmm? All right, let's see what God says. You with me, eh? Let's see what God said. Jeremiah 31, 34. I read it in your hearing. Jeremiah 31, 34. Let's see what the Bible says. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their what? And I will do what? Remember their sin no more. Hmm. I know you read that before. And I know, therefore, we definitely believe what God says. God said, I will forgive your sin and iniquity and I will remember no more. What do you think, God? What's, what do you think the Bible is saying here in regards to God in dealing with sin and remembrance and forgetting? What do you think? Is that what he's saying? As you con contemplate that. First of all, God is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. God is all-knowing. We know my, our God does not have amnesia. Do you think God forget? <laughs> Silence. Silence. That's all right. Well, what does that mean then? Does he forget? She said he doesn't remember no more. Does he forget? What does that mean? Well, let's get out the mystery here. The word remember in this passage does not refer to memory. In this passage, but to covenant. A covenant is a promise. When God forgives our sins, he does not forget them. Rather, notice what it says. Rather, he makes a promise not to treat us as our sins deserve. He chooses, notice this, to absorb the cost himself. In the person and work of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. He doesn't forget. In the hippocampus of your brain, it is stored there. However, therefore, when we are forgiven by God and understand forgiveness, we see the person who hurt us not as they deserve. But we are willing to take the punishment ourselves. Wow. So when a person comes to me and I say, don't you remember what you did to me? Mm -mm, I don't say that. I see the person in a different view through the eyes of God. And where God can redeem that person. Anybody with me here? And I know it's something different from you to understand that. It is there. But it's the way we see through the eyes of God. Because you're going to see, ladies and gentlemen... When God cleanses this earth of all of his impurities and when you and I, if we, if we stay faithful and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and we walk on the sealed glass and we stand there with Christ and there's no more glasses, no more pain, no more acne, no more cancer, nothing deformed in our body except for one person, Jesus would still have those scars. Amen. Are you listening to me? Amen. We're fine here. So what are the effects? Let's move on very quickly. There's an intimate relationship between the mind and the body. The emotions are a very powerful influence which affects the body. Our emotions. There's a body-mind connection. A wonderful book tells us this. What does it say? Nine-tenth what? Nine-tenth disease are what? Do you recognize that? Not if. Since that is true, even medical doctors a fighting situation that's supernatural when they deal with cancer and AIDS. Since this is true, and I believe it's true because to me it's inspired. It says here, sickness of the mind prevails everywhere. Nine-tenths of the disease from which men suffer have their foundation where? In the mind. And there is no prednisone, ibuprofen can handle that. I don't know if you got it. 
no herbs, no kava kava, no St. John's wort. There has to be a supernatural power that sets you free. I know that from personal experience. We find here in a wonderful book, Ministry of Healing, here, page 241, you can read it. It's a chapter called Mind Cure. Wonderful book. I told some folks who come this afternoon who never, not part of this little church, give them a free gift. Notice what it says. It says, the relation that exists between the mind and the body is very what? Intimate. When one is affected, the other sympathizes. Uh, the elder, I, can, I just sympathize with him. You know, he said if he was rescuing somebody hanging over the cliff, but he just stumped his toe. And I guarantee you, I, I've done that, but I didn't break my toe. I stumped the toe. The mind said, mouth say, ouch. Mind said, hand grab toe. <laughs> there has to be a sympathy between the mind and the body. Notice what it says here. Many of the diseases from which men suffer are the results of mental what? And, 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 and distrust. What do they do? All tend to break down the life forces and invite decay and death. So does our emotional state impact our physical existence? Yes, it does. Notice what this doctor said. He wrote this. Dr. Cannon was a professor at Harvard University in the late 50s. Notice what he says. He says here, he has shown that hate, envy, scorn, jealousy, and fear actually creates poisons. Not psychological poison but powerful toxic substance which poisoned the life stream, the blood. For Leviticus 17 11 said, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. A wonderful writer inspired in the book Minutes of Healing, page 271, it said, in order to have good health, we must have good blood. Huh? Notice what he says. It says, and under their influence, the body does what? It weakens. That's what it says. It weakens. Very important to understand this. I'm clicking the wrong button here. Keep clipping here. Let's get it back on here. Then it says, all the life processes are what? A person who lives under fear or under it of the shadow of any depressing emotion seems to what? Shrivel up. He grows old prematurely. Worry kills a hundred people where work only kills one. Our emotions definitely impact our physical existence. Notice Dr. Christian Northart says here, a thought held long enough and repeated often enough becomes a belief. That belief then becomes biology in which emotional stress causes adrenal glands to produce corticosteroids, hormones that weakens our immune system. Even science catching up with the word of God. Anger, the most, what, toxic emotion. One minute of anger suppresses your immune system for six hours. What do you think about that? And just think, you don't drink no water, don't get no rest, and just one minute of anger. And you talk about you need some immune booster. You need some freedom from anger. Hmm? Anger. An angry man, according to Confucius, is always full of poison. A story of a famous 18th century British surgeon by the name of John Hunter. He said, my life is at the mercy of any scoundrel that can put me into a passion. That means any fool, he says, that can stir up me emotionally can control my life. That's what he said. And on one occasion, he and a colleague got in a heated argument. I mean, so heated that John Hunter stormed out the door, went into the next room, and dropped dead. Anger. An angry, bitter, unforgiving spirit produces negative chemical byproducts that's health-destroying. Our emotions. A story of a woman. As we try to finish this, finish this up. It was in 19, probably 92, one of my turning points in my experience in health ministry. Here was a woman that was diagnosed clinically with a liver condition for 30 years. 30 years. Medication lost their effect. The doctors gave up on her. 
energy level was almost zero, the skin color was just deteriorating, and she stayed constantly nauseated. Providentially, we were operating a facility in another part of the country during that time, and she came to the place where there was a retirement, and we put her on a plan according to God's plan, and we worked with her, and within probably several weeks, the woman began to experience remission from her condition. She began to feel super. She said, I never felt this way in 30 years. Her energy level came back. Skin color appeared. Two weeks later, she went into a relapse. We, put a, we gave her liver packs and good food. We prayed for her, and she got better again. This happened three times. She kept going back and forth, back and forth. Until I came to the conclusion, I said, something is, is, is impeding her healing. And when I went to bed that night and woke up just doing my devotion, and as I was scanning through the scripture, something caught my eye in the book of Daniel, chapter 8, verse 7, in the King James. And it talks about this he-goat in this ram in Daniel 8, verse 7, that this he-goat ran with, there's a word there in the King James. That word is Kohler, Kohler. And I looked at the word and I understood the context of anger. But I said, why did the writers use that word Kohler? So I began to do a little research on that word and found out that word associated with devil, with a, in temperament, uh, rage, irritability. It was associated also with the liver. Bow. So liver came. How long this woman been suffering? 30 years with what kind of problem? Liver problem. So that word Kohler associated with liver, anger in liver. And so, therefore, when I got up, I spoke to this lady and I asked her a question. I said, are you dealing with some unresolved emotional issues in your life? She began to weep. She went into silence and then I realized I was entering into territory that was not for me to go into. I said, you don't have to talk about it. She said, I need to talk about it. I have not talked about it in 30 years. And she said, Everything I, every time I think about it, I, became, I become angry. She said, my father molested me for 15 years of my life. My husband also sexually abused me to the point where it damaged my reproductive organs. And I cannot forgive those men. I hate them. Are you listening to me? Every time she reflect upon that, the bitterness caused a stimulation of bowel and toxicity that poisoned her bloodstream. I knew at that point all the herbs, all the drugs, all the hydrotherapy had no avail until that woman had been set free. And that's when God took me on a journey. But make a long story short, when we worked on that and prayed, when she released that to God, her liver was 100% healed. Holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. <laughs> Be angry and sin not. And let not the sun go down upon your wrath. It's already been stu studies found that persons who forgive easily tend to enjoy greater psychological well-being and have less depressed depression than those who hold grudges. There's a physiology of forgiveness. When you do not forgive, it will chew you up. Hmm. Let us close out here then with three simple steps of biblical forgiveness. We see what forgiveness is. It's more than just saying, I'm sorry. It's releasing that person from the right to pay you back. It's dismissing it. Is seeing that person through the eyes of God who needs the same forgiveness and deliverance as you did. It's bringing peace. So let's close out then here with some steps of forgiveness. So first of all, man's way seeks revenge. Rehearse the injury. Resentment. Revengeful thoughts. Retribution. Retribution. We find here God's way here on the right hand side it restores relationship shows remorse it releases it brings restitution reconciliation so we must learn how to do what choose to forgive huh the bible tells us if we confess our sins he is what just and forg to forgive us 
Holding a grudge is letting someone live rent-free in your head. And so as I close out with these three, I want you to listen to me. As I close out with these three simple, very simple steps, this is what we're going to do. This is what I want you to pray in your heart. It says here, holding a grudge is letting someone live rent-free in your head. When you have a tenant renting from you, and they have violated the lease, and they just continue, you have to give them an eviction notice. So this morning, ladies and gentlemen, as we close out, we're going to give the devil an eviction notice. And the eviction notice is forgiveness. We're going to forgive the brother. When we forgive, the devil is evicted. Keep this in mind. He's evicted. So three steps in closing. The first one here, relinquish my right to do what? I got to say, Lord, I relinquish my right to get even. It says here, you have to start by letting the person who has hurt you off the hook. That's not fair, you say. You remember that? You're right. Forgiveness isn't fair. It wasn't fair when what? Forgave you. And it's not fair for you to forgive someone else. God doesn't give us what we, he gives us what we, so the first step we got to relinquish, continue. Notice what it says here. It says the first step here to forgiveness is to commit to not take justice into your own hands. Let God be the what? You find that in Romans chapter 12, verse 19. God said, vengeance is what? And then you don't go and pray, say, Lord, make sure he get ran by a truck. <laughs> Your prayer is this, Lord, deliver him. But first of all, before you pray for him, Lord, give me the spirit of heaven to love him like you love him. Am I making sense to anybody? Now, follow me this. Follow me now. Every time you remember how you've been hurt, what should you do? It has to be what? When Jesus was asked how often, he said what? 70 times 7. Every time this pain come to you, you say, Lord, I release it. Notice what it says. How do you know when you totally release the hurt? When it doesn't hurt anymore. If you sit in here forgiven and it still hurt, you have not been, you have not forgiven. So every time it comes, say, Lord, here is the hundred time to keep coming up. I release it. 200 times, I release it until there is no more pain. Number two, in that, you want to refocus on God's purpose for your life. You do not want to be a slave to your past. When they train elephants, they get elephants when they are young, they put a chain around their ankles and tie it to a bar stake. And it's so long where the trainer will do prompting and the elephant will come so far, but he has this chain. And as the elephant grows and learning this custom, they remove the chain from the elephant leg. But the elephant would do the same thing he did years prior. He would come no further because he still thinks the chain is on his legs. The devil keep us chained to our past hurt. God want to break those chains. There's an animal called the impala, not the automobile, the impala. Belong to the little gazelle, the deer. The impala has the ability to leap 10 to 12 feet in the air. But one of the characteristics they study about the impala, that he would not jump over those high gates or bushes unless he knows where his feet are going to land. That's a characteristic of the impala. So when they catch the impala, they don't put him in a 30, 40 feet fence. They put him in a three feet concrete wall. How high can he jump? 12 feet. But he would not jump over the three feet concrete wall. Why not? Because he don't know where his feet going to land. So the devil has us in a three feet concrete wall when we can soar 12 feet. Because we don't know where our feet going to land. God said, I already went that way. We got to come out of that wall refocus you got to set a definite aim God has called us to holiness usefulness do not let your past control your present the truth is you don't release the person who has hurt you then you resemble that person you keep thinking about that person and you become by beholding you become changed if you focus on pain that's what you move toward 
If you focus on purpose, that's what you move toward. My life is purposeful. Unforgiveness, like I said, is taking, pausing, but expecting someone else to die. How do you do that? The Bible tells us in Job, write it down, Job 11, 13 through 6. Make your heart right with God. This morning, say, Lord, here's my heart. It's wretched. Take it. Let me finish this last point here. Be fine. Put your heart right. Face the world again. Don't withdraw. Don't put yourself in a shell. Live a loveless life. Number three, respond to the evil with good. When someone do you injustice, even God said, give your enemy a cup of cold water. If you've been abused, if that abuser have, needs some help, you don't have to go to the abuser yourself. You can always find someone to go and help the abuser. One of the persons that went to one of my meetings was abused. And what happened to this person, she went to her abuser with somebody else and said, first of all, I'll forgive you. Then secondly, would you forgive me for hating you? And he was set free and became a Christian. Rewards of forgiveness. Clear conscience proves relationship, joy, and happiness. It protects us from Satan's snares, clears the way for God's forgiveness. Jesus said, peace I give unto you. Not as the world I give. Only God can give that peace. And I've been down that road and I said, Lord, I've been hurt and I probably hurt, but I hurt. And therefore, I need that quality you get. I need to set the person free. Give that to me. And I have to face the person in the spirit of heaven. What about you? You know, we have to face reality. We can go to church every week. We can sing the songs of Zion. When the doors are closed, we still got pain. Money cannot cover that up. Clothes cannot cover that up. Sermons cannot close it up. But this morning, before I close, I want to pray for somebody this morning because I had to go down that road. I remember I grew up in a family of eight, and as you prepare, I want to pray for some folks this morning. I grew up in a family of eight, and I realized that I'm the youngest out of eight children, and the next one to me is 12 years older than I am. But my seven siblings had the same father, but I did not have the same father. And so it was a moment of pleasure between my mother and my father who produced this treasure. <laughs> and it was not a condone the act in which they went through. But I never met my father, never have met my father. I grew up in the inner cities of Chicago, and therefore I was surrounded with basketball folk, and therefore you did not feel the need of a man, but mothers cannot raise men. Are you listening to me? Mothers, they do all the best they can. And not until when I, my career as a professional basketball player ended, when I felt the pain, I said, where's the father? Where's someone I can really connect with? You see, within the DNA of every person, there is a desire to be connected with their biological parents. I don't care what grandparents do. I, I'm a grandfather. But there's a connection that needs to be there. And I remember I was so impressed. I became so depressed. I said, I need to find this man who spurned me because I had bitterness in my heart. I had resentment in my heart. And I remember going looking for this person, not recognizing that he was already married when he had married my mother and his, he didn't have any other children. And I was not a Christian. I remember knocking on that door. I finally found him. I was excited. And the woman opened the door. And I said, does Mr. So-and-so live here? She said, yes. She said, who's calling? I said, I'm his son. She went off. Ballistic. Every expletive came out of her mouth. And I went away dejected. 20 years later, I'm a born-again Christian. Providentially, I was in the same area where my father lived again 20 years later. This time I did a little Rahab situation. Even though she was ignorant of the fact, but I did a little Rahab. Anybody know who Rahab was when she hid the spies? She, according to her understanding, she told a little lie. So when I got there, I'm not justifying that. I've been repentant of that a long time ago. I knocked on the same door. I want you to listen to me as I want to pray for somebody this morning. I knocked on the same door. The same woman answered the door. 20 years later, my brother, 
I must be different. I knew my father was a very well-known person in this little town, and he was a member of one of these local churches, very prominent. And I said to the woman, she said, I said, does Elder so-and-so live here? She said, yes. She said, who's calling? I said, well, we're doing a survey in the community to assess how the church is impacting the spiritual needs of the community. And we heard that Elder so-and-so is a leader here, and I like, we like to talk with him. Are you listening to me? That's, he came out. I've not seen this man in my life. As he came out, he looked at me, grabbed my hand. He must have knew something and pulled me into the yard away from her I looked at him and I said do you know who I am he looked me up and down I began to share about my mother I said look you got a grandchild now I'm doing well I don't want anything I did want something I want to be connected I didn't tell him that I wanted to be bonded back with this man and I looked this man in his eyes and I said I forgive you forgive you. I did not go through any explanation. I forgive you. And I said, even though you didn't know what's going on in my heart, but I need to ask you for forgiveness, for hating you, for resenting me, resenting you, for the agony that my mother, that, that, that you brought and that I want you to be dead. Will you forgive me? At that moment, I was set free. Two years later, this has been so many times. Two years later, our, our daughter said, Dad, you talk about granddad. He lives in this town. My daughter's accountant. She said, I need to find granddad. I said, go find him. But he had passed away today when you hear his voice. It's not worth holding on to any bitterness. We need to be set free. Does anybody want to come? I want to pray with you this morning. Because remember that leper. How quick was it for Jesus to heal that leper? There's nothing wrong with coming forth and said, Lord, I want to be set free.